Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 148 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. How's it going? Ooh, it's going pretty good. You sound like in a better mood than last week. I am in a better mood than last week. I'm doing good. Is everybody back from their COVID? No, just my technician that kicks my ass because she's such a high producer. And so it's absolutely wonderful having her back. Yes. Do you bow to her when she comes back? Do you like get on your knees and say, thank you? <laughs> No, but internally, I am doing that, yes. But yeah, yes. super cool, and I made sure she knew I missed her. Are they still ill, or are they totally fine? Well, they have to test negative to come in. She's still coughing a little bit. Yeah. Kind of dragging a little bit, but no, uh-uh. Yeah. We didn't get it too bad. Well, that's good. She was out for three weeks, though, because she kept testing positive, but finally. Oh. <laughs> Is it pretty easy to get tests down in Florida? Because here you can get them just about anywhere all the time. Yeah. That day. Yeah. yeah. We got the rapid one and then you've got the two dayer. But yeah, they're pretty efficient. Yeah. Hopefully vaccines will get there soon. Yes. So exciting this week. Summer Dental has printed their first temporary crown. I'm Congratulations. Proud of this. Yes, yes. We're never known for, you know, cutting edge and being the first to do anything. But with the Forum Labs from a sponsorship we had a while ago, you know, I've had the printer and we got some of their temporary material and actually I did it. It was pretty exciting. Sweet. Yeah. Congratulations. It actually seeded and we're going to send it out. So I'm pretty happy. Have you guys printed any? No. Fixed yet? No. Nope. I guess that's going to be the new thing. It's pretty nice not having to send it through the mill. I'm game. Let me know how it goes. Yeah, for sure. You know, me with a handpiece is dangerous. I think I only lost two fingers, but... (laughs) Did you drop it on the floor ten times? Uh, yes. I do have a tendency to do that. My ass is up in the air because I'm on the floor picking up veneers. (laughs) (laughs) And not in a sexual way, just saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Good to know. Good to know. I will say polishing a temporary with a handpiece is a whole new experience for me. Oh, yeah. Good for you. That's that cool. thing went fwing like six times. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah. I never sit at a bench. You know, I'm just not a technician. And all the employees were like, so you're joining us at the bench? And I'm like, I can't believe you people do this all day long. <laughs> <laughs> and we love it. Yeah, I know. I could see why. It was fun to actually produce something. I mean, Good I've been for doing you. this for a long time and I've never really produced anything. I mean, I didn't design it. I will proudly say I did not design it, but it was fun to like get it into the printer, get it out, cut it off the supports. It was it was fun. Well, it's good. Initiation complete. You're ready to go. Yeah. So all <laughs> I got to do is find someone I can hand it off to. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on this week? So this week we are pleased to have Arian Deutsch, CDT, join us on this week's episode. Arian is a name that you probably see a lot online, and back when we had them, he was at conventions talking about all the amazing things he and his wife are doing with telescopic implant bars. Arian talks with us about working at his family lab, moving to become or almost become a denturist, and how he's able to select who he works with in order to make these fascinating restorations that combine CAD CAM technology with handcrafted art. It's a great conversation about a really cool restorative option. So join us as we chat with Arian Deutsch. Hey Barb, I called Oradent the other day about their P5 milling machine. Super! How did it go? I was introduced to the consumables Oradent offers, such as Delta Zirconia, Oradent ZR, Oradent cutting tools, and Quest PMMA. How convenient! You know what? You can buy the mill and the materials from them. Yeah, if you think that's convenient, you can also buy furnaces by Napertherm, and vacuums by Renfert. Plus, I don't have to talk to a different person every time I call. I have a rep dedicated just for me. I have heard that their service is amazing. Absolutely. Oradent offers high-quality cutting tools made here in the USA, and they have great options for zirconia. Delta Zirconia, which is a super cost savings for labs, 
and Orident ZR made proudly here in the U.S. of A. Do they still offer dental alloys? You know, Orident started off manufacturing alloys and will always provide high-quality alloys for dental labs, one of the few companies in the U.S. to still manufacture their own alloys. Is there anything that they don't supply dental labs? Actually, they also offer dental scanners and a 3D printer from Shining 3D. Hold up. Does that scanner have its own design software? Actually, Orident offers ExoCAD for your designing needs. Nice. I'm not the best with technology and setting up all of this equipment, just saying. Well, we know, but that's <laughs> fine. Orident has a technical support team who can help with installing or troubleshooting any problems. Wow, Orident definitely is a one-stop shop for any dental lab's needs. How do we get in touch with them? You can always call our friends at Orident at 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit them at their website at Oradent.com. We super appreciate your support of the podcast, Oradent. Thank you so much. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. We are super happy to have on the podcast today a gentleman that... Actually, we took a few tries to get this going, but yeah. finally we're all free enough to get connected. Arian Deutsch, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you. It's good to be here. Nice. We shared the virtual stage for the Denturist meeting in October, yes. and sharing a virtual stage really doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, we didn't really <laughs> connect, but you got a big presence in the Denturist, but you're not a Denturist. Do I understand that correctly? Well... Not really. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Very good intro, Elvis. All right. Oh, well, let me see. Should I tell the whole story? Oh, God, that's, yes. That's we why you're here, story. man. We want okay. the whole story. Okay, well, I'll start back in the early 90s, 92, 93. I was just starting out working in my father's small laboratory. And for the next 15 years, you know, I was doing complete denture prosthetics, partial denture prosthetics, implant prosthetics, stuff like that. Long story short, uh, after about 15 or so years of that, or actually it was probably a little bit less than that, maybe about 10 years in, I was kind of getting tired of getting the really bad impression that you knew was really bad and calling the office and, you know, you get back, well, just make it anyway. Sure. So I was kind of wanting to take control of that end because I'm thinking, how hard could that possibly be? Just having hands-on indentures for that long, you know? Yeah. And I checked out a couple of National Denturist Association meetings. First one was in Florida. And then from there, a couple of great people. Give a shout out to Austin Carbone. And boy, just a, I met a really great group of people. And they just sent me in the direction of education. They said, look, you know, you've got to get educated. So the way to do that right now is to go to George Brown College in Toronto, go to their IDEC program, which, which at that time was their International Denturist Outreach Program. And I started that this was back in 2004 and drove, you know, from Connecticut up to Toronto a few times and proctored some exams out in Maine. And uh, right about at the time I was completing that program, one of the students in my class was from Arizona and he said, hey, you know, they're, they're getting ready to open Arizona back up in 07 for licensing. Mm. So I said, well, I, I, I think I much prefer the weather in Arizona to Maine. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Tired of Connecticut and the snow. So uh, my wife and I flew out here in 06 to Arizona to check out what was going on. Uh, met up with Art Silva, who was out here, uh, was a denturist out here in, in the West Valley. And from there, you know, it gets a little messy. At that point, we were told, well, Arizona is not going to accept the education that you have from George Brown. So you've got to go to Bates College in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, but good for you. They're going to do a satellite program in the Phoenix area because they're going to get licensing open back up in, in 07. So uh, we were in still Connecticut until 07. Uh, when I saw the actual, the dental board accepted Bates College as an approved education, which was huge. They hadn't really, Arizona had nothing going. It was, it was essentially dead in the water for 20 some odd years. Mm -hmm. uh, so when they accepted Bates, I said, well, I think it's time to, to leave our home state of Connecticut and, and strike out West and let's do this. Uh, so my wife and I just, you know, we both had been in Connecticut our entire lives. We moved out to Arizona with just not much, but hoping that we could uh, finish out the program. We already had, you know, already had the education from George Brown. So this was going to be kind of a pilot program 
in the Phoenix area. Well, you know, as, as you all remember, you know, the economy was kind of tanking. Oh. Yep. And, uh, you know, we got out here. I was out here for about six months, bought a house. And the next thing I know, I'm starting to push, like, when are we starting? When are we starting? Because, you know, I've got to get going and open a practice and, and make some dentures here. <laughs> and, yeah, Bates said, well, sorry, economy's not doing great and we're not going to put the program uh, on anymore. <laughs> no so I, way. So wow. you moved out there before a start date of the school. Wow. Yes, yes. That's ballsy, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey. Big time. So that's what happened. We kind of just hit the ground and from that day it was nothing but fun for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm cold calling, you know, doctors walking into dentist's office a- asking for work cuz I'm going to be kind of financially in trouble soon. I mean, my wife and I started our laboratory. We just rented like a 600 square foot space and started, you know, doing some denture work and slowly gradually over time it built up and um Kind of the rest is history in terms of the denturist side. Fast forward to a couple of years ago, I kind of had given up on the whole thought of uh, being a denturist out here. And I was fortunately at that time, I was heavily involved in implant prosthetics. So we were doing well. Mm-hmm. However, Todd Young, as, as some of you may know, the American oh, Denturist yeah. School, yeah. that came through and I said, well, maybe it's it's worth looking into again uh, because Todd's awesome. You guys know him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's, boy, he's just full of fire. And he, he you know, I, I kind of got the feeling after meeting Todd that, you know, this guy stands behind what he says. This isn't just talk. He's going to make it happen. And there's no reason that Arizona can ignore him because his curriculum, <laughs> True. Er, you know, curriculum is much stronger with the school than anything I had seen. So I did the expedited one-year program. Super, super program. was really, really a tough year to to get through it. 40 some odd patients uh, later. And uh, now I'm actually at the point where all I need to do is take my board exam, pass that, and I will be able to be a practicing denturist in Arizona. So that's basically uh, the short version. Ah. Can I ask you a question about the expedited program? So that's a one year, 40 patient. What is what is the other program? Is it two years? Uh, typically it's a, you can do, a, I believe right now you can do a three or a two year. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty crazy. I, I don't want to go back to that year. <laughs> How do you keep that all together? 40 patients, 40 cases. Do you have to document everything also? Oh, absolutely. Photos, the whole nine yards. Uh, and, you know, the way our state works is I had a friend who's a general dentist and fortunately he was kind enough to basically go in it with me. And, you know, cause he's got to inspect the work, sign off on all the work. And um, yeah, it's, it's a big undertaking. Uh, fortunately he had the patient population because he was, boy, he was awful busy and he was kind of involved in some work with Cass clinic down here, which is homeless and veterans. Uh, oh, so we had, huh? we had a really large that. patient pool. Yeah. So it was cool. nice. Is that one year offered to everyone or just you because you've done so much schooling at that other school? No, I'm sure. I know there was some consideration, I believe. I, I can't even remember at this point, given because I had done yeah. so much education up to that point. But uh, I believe anybody can still do that in a year if they can hack it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they still open that up to them. 40 patients in one year. So I'm accredited with the uh, AACD and, and that's like uh, five years. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. One year, 40 patients to me just sounds crazy. Do you have to do different things or is it 40 similar cases or, you know, is it like three of this, five of that? What what is, how do you get through that? It's a variety. I mean, you know, a lot of it was complete dentures, single arches, full arch, you know, full, complete upper and lower dentures. Some of it was partials, uh, a lot of different things. So yeah, but primarily complete dentures and partial dentures and in a variety of combinations. Okay. Kudos to you. That's amazing. Thank you. So during that year, you were also running your lab at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Barely holding on. Um, I can imagine. A lot of long nights. It's a lot of teeth in your life. (laughs) It is. It is a lot of teeth. So when you opened your lab in Arizona, what did you first start doing? Was it only removables? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing that happened to me. I was doing primarily removables, so complete dentures, partials. We would do night guards, all the standard removable laboratory type sure. stuff. And what happened for me was, you know, I, and I say this, fortunately for me, when I started in the lab, I feel like I already had a foot up because uh, I was in my father's small lab and it was just me and him. And he was an old Swiss Ident graduate. So he was at Swiss Ident in the late seventies when John Frush was there. And so basically when I came in, uh, you know, my father gave me everything he had like all at once, 
it was pretty heavy and uh, it was kind of very natural looking dentures like you might see in Europe. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of always my aspiration. And, and I feel like I benefited a lot because he had already been doing it for 30 some odd years. So I kind of got all of that right in the beginning. Uh, so I had a really good foundation and, and it helped me to, I feel like, get ahead a little bit in terms of, you know, it's not like I was just starting in the in the plaster room, you know, yeah. So yeah. that was really, really helpful. So when we landed kind of on our butts here in Arizona, fortunately I hooked up with a few really, really good specialists, a few prosthodontists. Uh, one of them was Patrick Canaday, who also happened to be a Swiss event graduate. So we were kind of right along the same line and uh, just doing a lot of high-end dentures essentially. And that kind of changed pretty quickly. In the first few years I was here, all on four, we had a really early adoption of clear choice. So clear choice had a location here pretty early on. Oh yeah. And so, you know, I kind of referenced that and I said, Whoa, okay. So we're doing what we used to do in my father's lab. Of course, back then we were casting a bar and doing cow technique to pick up some cylinders, but essentially this is a screw retained acrylic thing. So we still have some of the same challenges, you know, although it's been cleverly repackaged, we still have some of these same challenges in terms of patients being able to clean properly, restorative space, all these things. So Pretty quickly, I jumped back and kind of just referenced some things that I had brush in with early on in my career, which was were telescopic and conical connections, kind of very similar to German double crown technique, mm-hmm. uh, which were basically patient removable. So we avoided a lot of the problems associated with a screw retained prosthetic. So once I started showing that around and doing some work with some local prosthodontists I work with, I was lecturing at the time too, which helped. But you know, we went from maybe doing 10% work like that and now... For the last five years or so, it's been over 95% all implant telescopic cases here. So we really don't do much more than that at this point. Wow. So you're not doing single unit anything? No, no. I mean, we we kind of flirt with the line a little bit in terms of fixed work uh, when it comes to materials. Mm -hmm. Initially, I was providing these telescopic cases with just acrylic and denture teeth. That kind of progressed into a lot of kind of, uh, how can I say trailblazing in terms of what connections we could do that over. And then it kind of morphed into another thing where some of my clinicians were saying, boy, you know, I love this, but we do know that we're going to have to replace the teeth, you know, five, six, eight years down the line. And do you got anything for us? And I said, well, let's work on some things. So this kind of morphed into us doing some frameworks that were thimble preparation frameworks where we would do a milled hybrid ceramic, for example. Mm -hmm. We could also do individually pressed ceramics uh, over these and cement them on. Uh, And so now you've got something that is very retentive for a very long time. And also we don't have this vertical wear. So it's kind of, you know, I kind of joke around and I'll post some things, you know, it's the, it's the golden bullet because they're just super long lasting. We kind of build some attachments into them as well, that when the patient loses retention, we can increase it again. Um, so that's kind of what we're after is, is making something that's going to be obviously aesthetic, right. But also solid and really long-term for the patient. Yeah. So you're talking about those bars where each one, it almost has individual preps along the bar. Is that what you're talking about? And then you can cement crowns. Yeah. I've seen those. I've never done any. Wow. And of course we've got to, you know, occlusion has to be dialed in. We've got to know occlusion and be spot on there. And And these are also, you know, they're removable too. So there's design, there's hand milling of of either individual abutments or bars, and then there's electroforming of gold. So that's primarily what our work is pretty much on a daily basis now. So Wow. So you know I'm going to ask this question. So you moved out there with your wife. Your wife's obviously involved with the lab. So is she there every day with you right on? Is she a technician also? What What is um, yep. that dynamic like? Yeah, great question. So 100%. Uh, Muriel, you know, for everyone that knows her, I mean, they they, they know what a super person she is. And uh, boy, she started actually, she was working right alongside me back in Connecticut in my father's laboratory. So for, for quite a few years, it was just the three of us. And when we came out here, same thing. She's always been a, a huge support. So she she started heavily analog and now she, her work is primarily shifted over to a lot of digital design. She's really blows my mind because we kind of, you know, we kind of brainstorm on these cases and, um, you know, she knows how to jump through the hoops and, and I'm kind of always kind of pushing her to, to, to jump through more. And that's basically, you know, that's primarily what she's doing right now is a lot of our, our designing of abutments, tertiary structures, all these things. 
Wow. So you're at work all day and then you're at home all day. So that probably yep. is a win-win, obviously. It is. You know, we, we don't have to discuss work when we get home because <laughs> we, were, we were both there. So <laughs> we can move on. <laughs> yep. Got it. What is she designing on? What are you doing most of these fantastic telescoping bars yeah. on? So we're using ExoCAD that we're using. Okay. Uh, Yep. So we're using a DOF scanner. So a degree of freedom, uh, freedom HD scanner, and she's designing boy over so many different platforms. And, you know, believe me, I mean, it's, it's crazy. We're constantly kind of evolving because there's platforms that we'd like to be able to do these over that previously were not possible. So some of the things that we've done recently, one of the things that happened was we have a lot of these patients that are in screw retained acrylic hybrid cases that you know, I get calls from clinicians all the time, all over the country that they're tired of it and they want to get the patient into something that the patient can remove and clean. Interesting. So these are these yeah. patients that went to like clear choice. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Got this package deal and they find out that they just can't keep up on the maintenance of it. Yeah. And, and yeah. You know, I mean, I would say maybe in a, in a smaller percentage of, of the population, you know, a hybrid is the solution to go with. But I feel like a lot of ways it's being pushed kind of to the masses. I agree. It's not for yeah. everybody, you know? And so that's kind of, we end up wanting to take these patients out of that. Problem is that sometimes the doctor doesn't want to go and remove the multi-unit abutment. And so we've, we've been able to, it, it's really been an honor and a privilege to be able to work with some people and, and actually develop over so far right now, over three different multi-unit abutment platforms, the first telescopic individual abutment cases, to my knowledge, in the world. So it's pretty, pretty cool over the uh, Stroman SRA abutment, for example, or the mm -hmm. Biometro profile abutment. So it's been, it's been pretty cool to be able to kind of pioneer some of those things, develop some digital libraries and uh, do some interesting stuff. How do you do that? Like, who do you, did you guys partner with them and you just try it out in the mouth? How do you do something like that? It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So fortunately for us at the multi-unit abutment level, you know, it's not like we're going direct to implants. It's not an FDA issue. And so we have some partners basically that are doing milling for me. And then we also contracted some people to do some, uh, some actual development of, for example, like um, digital libraries that, that will show an engaging geometry, whereas the company uh, digital library might just have a non-engaging geometry. So, uh, so there's a lot of little, you know, R and D that went into it, but um they're working out really well, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So you take these multi-unit abutments, and let's just say they're Strawman SRAs. Mm -hmm. They take a traditional impression, use the analog, scan that, and with ExoCAD, you build a substructure. That gets screwed in, and then you get a removable structure that goes over it. Am I understanding that? Let me back up. So, so with these telescopic cases that we specialize in, there's really just three components. There's the primary abutment, which is usually an individual custom abutment. Okay. Then there's a gold coping, and that fits the abutment between four and five micron. Yeah. And, and then there's the kind of the bar structure that ties everything together and strengthens the entire prosthetic. And that's typically designed here and printed in metal using basically a selective laser melting technique. And so that's kind of the three components. Um, but yeah, we're, we're designing custom abutments using a telescopic module, which odd enough is in all the softwares, right? If you look in, in all the softwares, whether it's three shape ExoCAD, whatever it is, they all have a telescopic module. Yeah. So, so somebody in Europe, well, well most of the Europeans are doing a lot of this work. Uh, it's, it's a staple really in Germany and Switzerland and Interesting. just not being done much here in the United States at all. So yeah, we've been trying to teach courses on it, uh, show the technique because for patients, it's a super technique. It's a hundred percent passive. The retention lasts a very long time for the patient. They can uh, chew, they can sneeze, they can laugh out loud, and it's not going to move until they want it to come out. So. Yeah. So those custom abutments, they go on top of the multi-unit? Yes. Wow. So how much clearance do you need for these? More than a, a hybrid? Yeah. So this is the interesting thing. Actually, what I do when we, we try to plan these as best we can. So so typically, course, we actually... Yeah. Normally, your multi-unit would be planned to be at tissue level or just above. Uh -huh. So when, when we do these, we're just kind of getting with the surgeon and saying, hey, we'd actually like this ideally to be maybe a millimeter and a half to two millimeters subgingival. And then we can develop for these custom abutments a nice emergence profile. We can have a nice margin right at the tissue level. And uh, 
get it on the hand mill and, and hand mill it and they look really nice and beautiful. but most of these cases you're getting from clear choice or somewhere else i mean they're already at tissue level or, or the ones we see they're well above tissue level because yeah. of the poor planning yeah and honestly in those cases it just depends like i I got to say, fortunately, I've been able to screen our clients uh, at yeah. this point, uh, you know, to the point where we're working with people that we're all on the same page. Sure. If we do a bailout case, that's a different scenario. Like I, yeah. I've got one here right now where, yeah, there's there's exposure at the multi-unit level. And we're actually doing for this case um, two telescoping bar sleeves. So it's kind of an adaption of individual abutments to a bar. So we're, we're actually doing a bar sleeve where we actually custom mill a primary bar it goes on the hand mill i have to hand mill it yeah and then electroform a sleeve and uh, same concept just over a bar interesting yeah you guys are talking way over my head just saying <laughs> elvis i'm very impressed with your questions well you know <laughs> wow. so when you say hand mill yes i mean are you taking a puck of metal and actually with a hand piece making a bar that's a great question no. <laughs> okay, good. Because I could only That's imagine insane. how hot oh. that thing would get and how long yeah. you would be milling it. I'd lose my mind. Uh, yeah. What happens is we scan these in and we, we design the abutments and they get initially milled at a milling center. Okay. And then when I get the abutments here, we take the model and we uh, basically I transfer. So we have our path of insertion and then we pick up the abutments from the master model and mm -hmm. transfer them to a, a what we call a milling model. Because as you said, right, the stone is going to heat up, the analog is going to heat up. Oh, yeah. So we transfer to this milling model using pattern resin for the individual analogs and abutments. And then, then from there, we go on to the hand mill. This way, the master model is protected. And then when you get on the master mill or, or on the hand mill, you can really, how can I say, it's, it's not so much like you're thinking of gross milling because it's already been milled in, in CAD and in CAD CAM. So at this point, we're really just treating the surfaces that have already been designed with margins and everything I in the software. It. Yeah. Yeah. So it's already been CAD milled to right. a point and you're just perfecting it or getting it exactly where you need before you move on. Exactly. And, and you can see, I mean, you may have seen some of the photos of these abutments. I mean, you can't achieve this out of CAM right now. Mm. And we're using a series. There's two different, there's a coarse burr and a fine milling burr. Each burr we use at two different speeds uh, until we get down to about 3000 RPMs on the fine milling burr, which is like a high fluted fine milling burr. And it's just, you get this super, super refined surface. That's cool. Yeah. What's the benefit to the telescoping bar yep. to something with a bar that just has like ERAs on it or locators or hater clips? Yeah. You've got some great questions today. Right? <laughs> He's on a roll. I love it. Sorry guys. So one problem I have, and maybe this is just a personal problem. <laughs> uh, so, That's what so we're here for. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Lay That's down. <laughs> therapy. So locators and ERAs, like you mentioned, are, yeah. are designed to be resilient attachments, right? Sure. Okay. So personally, my, I don't, I don't like to use locators. I don't like to use a resilient attachment that wasn't designed for being on a bar. That, that just wasn't their initial purpose. Even though it's being done quite a bit, it was really adapted. And so for me, a couple of the advantages here is that uh, number one, your locator or ERA is you know going to wear out over time, right? It snaps mm -hmm. in, snaps out. Eventually, you have to replace these. So with this electroform gold coping as the attachment to the bar, the benefit there is that you have a very very long term retention for the patient with no changing of the insert. So that's one benefit. Mm -hmm. The other benefit that is that it's extremely clean. It's, uh, you know, typically when we see these patients many years later, they remove the prosthetic and you can see the inside of the gold is just, it's shiny. It's basically just beautiful. It's clean. Wow. And so that's kind of, to me, one of the big benefits, um, you know, these resilient attachments, uh, you know, if we need to incorporate something because we need to incorporate movement into a prosthetic, well, that's one thing if it's due to maybe AP spread or some of these issues. But typically on these cases, it's just it's just a bigger advantage because we just don't have to replace parts. Well, yeah, that is a downfall to all of those. I mean, mm -hmm. the nylon's meant to wear out and yep. protect the metal, but apparently this gold-plated metal mm -hmm. doesn't wear, or it does wear, but it takes longer? So this is a great question. You know, I, initially when I was doing these cases, I was telling clients that, uh, well, look, 
if it's a metal to metal, so if we're using titanium, for example, as a primary abutment or bar, yeah. and we're using this high percentage gold for the coping, expect that maybe eight years or so, you're going to have a little bit of loss of retention. Now, I was just saying that, honestly, just based on rumors and hearsay, there's an interesting article that just came out in Germany, and it was talking about this specific issue. What it was basically saying is that really, when you're doing a zero degree attachment like this, there's really no friction on these surfaces. So there, there's no there's no angle for friction to occur on. What ends up happening is it's kind of a combination of adhesion and cohesion between the saliva and the close proximity of the gold to the primary part that is holding these in. So it's almost, if you can imagine, like a, like a hydraulic retention. Huh. And typically that, you know, theoretically shouldn't, from this, according to this article, should never wear out. Uh, because you're just not putting any, you're really not putting any friction onto this. When we start to get into like a mild cone angle, like a one or two degree, now we're starting to get a little bit of, of bearing of the brunt on the parallel walls because we've got this angle going on. So, you know, it's it, they last a long time. I can say that. Yeah. I, I can tell you I haven't replaced any copings due to just like normal wear and tear yet. So... Uh, it's pretty awesome. So what's holding these things in? I thought yeah, magic. <laughs> it was they were tapered. Yeah. So in your in your zero degree cases, like I've been doing quite a few zero degree bars, and it's really like I said, it's 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 literally just adhesion and cohesion, capillary action between the primary abutment or bar and the gold coping. So it, there's really they're not taking any wear and tear, you know, provided of course that the patient is well educated and you've explained to them you know, Mrs. Jones, we don't want you to just kind of put this halfway in and then bite it into place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They always do. <laughs> True. Uh, that would not work. Yeah. So that's, that's basically what is holding it in. It's kind of hard to explain. I know when I first started educating on it, it's really hard to explain unless you can see it and have it in your hands and, and see how it works. Yeah. Where's my attachment? Where's my plunger? Where's my... Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. We're used to that in the U.S., right? And seriously, it, it, I mean, it must, it holds an upper denture in and it doesn't fall out. That's amazing. Yeah. Yep. All right, Barb, your turn. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just trying to put, uh, I was curious. So is your father still alive and is he, does he still have a laugh? He does. He's in Connecticut right now, uh, still doing a lot of dentures and that's kind of, that's his thing. So yeah, he's still small laboratory, but yeah, he's still in, he's in Stratford, Connecticut. He has a small lab there, Eurotech Dental Concepts. So I'm assuming you grew up there, correct? So you were probably there every day or every summer oh, yeah, or every I was, something. I was playing in the wax and the acrylic, absolutely. <laughs> and playing with the monomer in my veins. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Explains a lot. Oh. Yeah, it does, actually. <laughs> so is he keeping up with all of your concepts and everything? So is he kind of, do you bounce all of these things off of your dad? Do you guys talk about these things? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's a uh, matter of fact, he came out to a course that we gave in Manhattan couple years back uh so he checked it out and yeah he 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 loves it he he says man just hey keep going you know yeah so are you still teaching so you were talking about your courses so i'm sure covid's impacted that a little bit um are you doing things virtually now or what yeah everything's gone to a virtual format and unfortunately you know i i kind of was really depressed because we uh we had just you know moved to this new location because we were traveling so much for education at the time and I said, man, let's let's just build a place out where we can have people come to us. And so uh, we had just gotten into this space a couple of years ago. And boy, I've got a really nice training facility here. And I was all ready to to get going right before the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yep. We've got a full espresso bar. That's where I'm sitting right now. And uh, <laughs> nice. it's, it's and went, pretty awesome. Oh, man. <laughs> what were you going to teach? These concepts? Yeah. So yeah. actually we were, we were going to open it up. So I've done a lot of education for just analog dentures, digital dentures, telescopic cases, whatever it is, even just, you know, a variety of implant solutions. We will teach bar design, you know, for hybrids, all that kind of stuff. And then also my thought here was that we also have a lot of friends in the industry that are also very active giving courses. So, you know, we've got equipment here where they wanted to burn some things out or press some ceramic or layer ceramic. We could do that here as well. So, so we had a, you know, had been kind of reaching out to a few friends and they said, yeah, we'd love to come out, maybe rent the space and, and teach our courses too. And I said, that, that would be awesome. And it's, it's kind of set up nicely so that the first floor is primarily all education. And then 
uh, upstairs, I've got kind of some personal like lab benches and stuff. So if people want to give wow. a course here, I can just kind of go hide upstairs and, and do my work. So wow. how many people can fit in the classroom? So right now, the it is a little limited in terms of the number because I wanted to keep it uh, small because in, you know, just teaching for, for these years, I've found sure. that six is kind of a good number where you're really going to make a difference and maybe impart some things and, and people are going to get something from it. So we've got a bench coming in from Kato, Italy. It seats six plus one at the end for as an instructor. So that's cool. basically our, our limit. That's some serious stuff if you're getting benches in from Italy. I was just thinking that. I, had I think ours came from Boston. Yeah. How do you find that? Oh, my God. It's a pretty slick piece. Uh, yeah, I imagine. Um, <laughs> that's the artist in me going wow that's beautiful so do you have any classes set up to come back once we can all travel again or are you totally on hold so we've been doing a lot of you know we've been really busy with the online stuff so we did obviously that national Venturist association we did the yeah. and uh even actually boy right before this next wave started i snuck out to colorado for an iti group mm-hmm. uh so we did a lecture out there and then I've got coming up the digital, you know, international digital denture symposium. But once that's behind us, we're already working on some other courses. We're, we're basically planning kind of two phases. One is obviously a, a few online courses for dentures. And then going forward, we we're working on developing just, just kind of getting a curriculum together for whenever it is that we can all meet here again. In sure. Person. You got to take it back to basics or are you going to? Yes, we are. To, yeah. We're going to do both. We're actually going to, we're doing a curriculum where you will get some, some really basic denture education with kind of all the little tips and tricks that we've picked up over the years. It's going to be kind of a curriculum where, you know, there'll be certain basic courses and then certain advanced courses. Yeah. And you can kind of pick and choose. I've told Barb this a million times. I always looking for a place I can send a newbie and learn how to do all this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's kind of getting lost, isn't it? It totally is. Yeah. Big time. How much are you doing digital when it comes to the actual denture? Are you in that or are you? It's funny. It's funny. So, so I kind of, I feel like maybe I have this reputation as a, <laughs> as a, as a digital hater. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you, yeah. <laughs> However, I've always said, look, let, let's just be real, right? We did a lot of work closely with, with some big players in the digital denture industry, did a lot of beta testing for them. So, Uh you know, it's coming from a position of I'm comparing, you know, what I can do that's very high end. That's my touchstone, right? So, I mean, if I'm just comparing it to like the average denture you might find in a larger setting, then, then maybe that gap is, that quality gap is, is more minimal. But I've just been very vocal about, okay, here's what we liked about the system and here's what we didn't like. I've also, as you know, I've maybe thrown out a little taunt here and there about, you know. Pit, pit me against a machine and let's see <laughs> where we, where we end up. Uh, oh, that's half the fun. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, you gotta, yeah. you gotta have fun. Right. So <laughs> I've got some interesting responses from that, but um, yeah, I haven't had anybody challenge me yet. So I'm, I'm still waiting, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, in terms of, I think, I think initially we were promised a lot. Right. So, so of, oh, course, yeah. of course, you know, on the fixed side, you know, I, I feel like people have learned to deal with this and they've learned, what the differences are when it, when it came over to the removable side, I think we had some people that felt very strongly one way or the other. You know, I think again, there are things that we can use from digital that make us more efficient, but we were promised a lot. We were promised faster. We were promised better, better, right. And cheaper. And I'm seeing very few companies that are actually delivering on that. Even now Uh, we're kind of just getting there. So I've never been one to kind of be kind of a glorified salesman. You know, I, I'm not going to get up and speak for a company and, you know, everything they do is awesome and we're doing it right now. I mean, I'm just going to give you the real, the real story. You know, here's what we liked. Here's what we didn't like. Here's where I think there needs to be improvement. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the only fair way to operate, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, we've heard pros and cons. Elvis and I have talked about uh, printed denitures for quite a while mm-hmm. um, on this podcast, but the majority of the folks and the technicians that we've talked to have been like, yeah, it's, you know, it's getting there. It's evolving. Yep. But very few have said, Hey, we're there, you know, this is it. Yeah. You know, everything's hundred percent. And so I think in all fairness to everybody, I think that's a really good stance that you're taking. And I'm sure when it does get there, 
you know, you'll acknowledge it and or be, you know, involved in it. Yeah. Well, you know, I can tell you literally right now, I mean, the only thing we're not doing here is milling. Uh, we're, we're actually, for a lot of these prosthetic implant prosthetic cases I'm doing right now, we've already switched over to printing our temps. Wow. So we're printing some custom trays. We're printing some temps. We're, I, you know, I think digital is a phenomenal record keeping tool. I think that's where I'm just really fascinated by the, by the ways that it impacts our daily work and, and makes us more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it just can't do what you can do by hand. No, I, I have yet to see, you know, I'll put it this way. If I have a client that, you know, wants a denture from me and we only offer really one level of service for like a complete denture, for example, it's, there's, we don't break it up into levels anymore. It's, it's signature level or that or nothing. You don't have an economy line? <laughs> nope, nope. Not anymore. We, hey, <laughs> I think at, at one point or another, everyone has, right? Um, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, we do. Yeah. Sure. But for me, you know, at our size, it's just me and my wife. And, you know, basically uh, for me to stop gears, like if, if I'm going to stop working on a telescopic implant case, for example, to go make an economy denture, I just, yeah, it's just not in our, our profile right I now. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. And we, again, we talk to a lot of technicians and, you know, you need to command what you're bringing to the table with your skill level and your education and everything that you're doing. I think that's great. I think that's a big downfall, right? Uh, for it's, it's hard to, to kind of fight. I, I know it was for me because I was not always in this position. Honestly, I give it up to Muriel, my wife, because she, you know, she didn't start out in this, you know, uh, I, I kind of <laughs> grew up around her. I saw my father, <laughs> yeah. you know, doing what he had to do to make things happen. And, and, you know, boy, the first few years when we were out on our own, I was just always very hesitant to put my foot down and, and, you know, but it just, honestly, it just came to a point where if you're going to do high-end work, you cannot afford to play games with, yeah, you know, people about these issues or, or about money either, you know, so we, we yep. totally overhauled the way that we our billing system. Uh, you know, we're not on that 30 day thing. We used to do that and that, that'll kill you. Yeah. Cause you're their bank a little bit. Yeah, essentially. You, you are, you really are. Do you think you could even make an economy denture or do you think it would be hard for you <laughs> to like, <laughs> to like lower your standard to get that thing done? It would be hard. I imagine. Like everybody else, we still have the occasional patient that is just, you know, she wants or he wants, you know, perfectly straight toilet bowl shape, you know, yeah. and, and they're just not going to get it. And you, you kind of, you bend a little bit and give them what they want. I mean, it's yeah. at the end of the day, it's about yeah. the patient. Make them as yeah. square as possible. Yeah. <laughs> put, it, put it to the trimmer if you have to, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so have you found any new materials or anything that you've um, used lately that we can talk about? That's like something that's, you know, amazed you or you think is really super cool? There's two. One is just on my radar right now that I'm going to, I plan on getting into. First one that I've been using for, for years now is uh, hybrid ceramics. So, um, you know, GC has the Sarasmart material and uh, Vita has the Enamic material. You know, it's been really interesting because, you know, these materials don't need to be fired to be repaired. They're easily millable. Some of the companies have them in a multicolor arrangement. And so we've done a lot of cases, um, actually quite a few with a good friend, uh, Ben Ross, out of Charlottesville, Virginia. He was a super, super clinician and, 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 a, and a great guy. Yes. We've done quite a few with him using individually milled hybrid ceramic dentition. You can actually texturize it, you can characterize it, uh, you can stain it. You basically use the uh, the glaze that comes with it. And um, it's nice in terms of being able to give something to the patient that, you know, is not going to wear down in five to eight years, they're going to have to be replaced per se. So, uh, and we really don't know what the longevity long term is going to be. I mean, we've got cases in the mouth going on three years now, Wow. little to no vertical wear, which is awesome. I'm pretty hopeful about those materials. Uh, there's even, man, I think actually Bago just sent me some samples of a printable hybrid ceramic. What is Bago not printing these? Man, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. I was going to ask for those of our listeners that don't know, like, what's your definition of a hybrid ceramic? Like, what does that mean? Yeah. So it's basically a composite infiltrated ceramic. So you've got this infusion and, and, you know, obviously the different companies have their different formulas and their different approach to it, but essentially you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Uh, so it's not as brittle as a ceramic. Mm -hmm. I would say if you look at like the, the modulus of elasticity, you look at the strengths that they're getting and they're closer to like natural dentition. 
So they're pretty interesting. They, they kind of came over like, I guess, like everything from the aerospace industry. Uh, so Boeing, yes. Boeing is using a lot of hybrid ceramics and actually in their engines. It's, it's pretty interesting material. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And that's millable, right? Yeah, it's millable. Yep. Is this the same material that Crystal Ultra is using? Ah. Well, it, it, it's similar. They call it a nano ceramic. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's there's a little difference in composition and, and, and the makeup of them. The one that we've been using primarily, I would say we've split it between GC's Sarah Smart and Vita Enamic. Yeah. Uh, and we're getting really great results with those. So it's it's been a lot of fun to be able to play around with those. And we're getting some nice results. I mean, uh, we've published some of these cases and I'm, I'm very hopeful because at least now the ones that are in the mouth going on three years have done very, very well. But it just time will tell, you know. Is it just the teeth or is it teeth in the Yeah, just the teeth. Acrylic. Just the teeth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I only do individually milled. Uh, you know, this way, I mean, if someone drops it and then breaks one or, or cracks one, you know, we can just re it. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Is that super hard on your uh, milling burrs? You know, it's not on mine because I'm not milling them. So that's, <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> oh, the benefits point. of outsourcing. Oh, that's boy. the one thing I have heard about that is that it's like a to mill. In the beginning, I know when we did the first few cases, it was a real challenge finding somebody that can mill it. Mm. Yeah. I've been working, fortunately for me, I've, I've got some friends that are the really great people and, and great contacts. So fortunately for me, I've been working really closely with Chris at uh, Primo Tech USA and they're milling all of our all of our hybrid ceramics and and doing phenomenal with it so it's been really great. Uh, nice. So do you scan it your wife designs it you send it to them and they mill it? Yeah and you know the kind of awesome thing is there's this fusion of uh, I feel of of denture and fixed kind of concepts. So you know we actually will start with a denture tooth try-in and fortunately, we've been able to get the STL files of the specific denture teeth because we want to live up to nice. the promise that we've made the patient, the, the preview that we've given them, right? Yeah. So what Muriel does is she'll scan in our try-in that was approved, and then she'll pop in the STLs, adapt the STLs so they pop right into the positions of the actual try-in. And she cuts out the bottoms of the STL and, and basically adapts it to this thimble-prepared framework. Wow. Yeah, it works out really, really well. And like you said, you do single units. So anything breaks or anything happens, you just redo a single unit. You're all in. Yeah. Yep. Really easy, really wow. fast. That's cool. What's the other material you're excited about? Yeah. So I'm wanting to do more of these cases as well, or at least offer more of basically individually pressed ceramic. And so our concept for that is that we're going to take those same designs that Muriel does and we're going to print them, invest them, press them. However, I really want to do a little more, uh, particularly in the anterior six, to get a really nice look to this. So I've been actually going back and forth uh, with the folks at Jensen about this Neo material. Neo. Yeah. Yep. yeah. She loves awesome. I knew that's where you're heading. Just saying. <laughs> yep. Amazing. <laughs> yep. It'll be here soon, and, and I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. But it's, it's just, uh, to me, boy, well, I think there's phenomenal people there. You know, we talk about people like James Choi and, and Ed Don Cornell, it's yep. like, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> it's gotta be good. And I've been just kind of, you know, really getting up to speed on it. And my, one of my concerns was, okay, all right, we can, we can lay down these liquid ceramic colors. And, you know, I kind of transfer that from what I've always done to denture teeth. I've always characterized them with, with light curing stains and pastes and different things. And so it's, yeah. to me, it's like, okay, this is the natural progression for, for any denture technician if you want to get into that, then Mio seems to be right up our alley. My only other concern was like, I'm asking the people at Jensen, well, all right, but what about texture? And well, they've got the structure materials. So it's kind of a, a beautiful thing. You are going to love it. Just saying. I can't wait. So I got that, um, I don't know, in March when we got quarantined and everything was crazy in Florida. And I um, tried out the structure and, you know, I, I'm big on anatomy and all of that and fire it. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you what goes in comes out um so you're gonna love it. what you get it's awesome yep you're gonna love it did i miss what are you putting the meal on doesn't it need to be fired yes what we would do is we'd press these units uh maybe texture a little bit and then you can lay it on there and fire it yeah so we'd fire it here so they'd be lithium desilicate yes teeth? oh yep. wow or, or zirconia oh okay yeah wow we've got options 
That's definitely not your economy denture anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, probably not. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, we morphed into something I can talk about, Elvis. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Time stealer. It's interesting though. I've seen people, you know, like like uh, Jeremiah Noss too. It's it, it opens up possibilities in terms of your your partials, right? We can do a cast framework with a prepared individual thimble preparations for for a partial that maybe would last a very long time, right? Yeah. yeah. So are you going to bring these type of restorations to your practice when you're a denturist? So yeah, that's a, it's a great question. What I can tell you is I was really, really hot on becoming a denturist. And yeah. when I was younger, I would say I had more fire about that because I was, you know, oh, I'm sick of these impressions and this and that and the other thing. And, and now it's kind of, kind of come 180 because over this period of time, over these last decade, basically, you know, I've gotten to know some really, really great clinicians. And uh, I got to tell you, like my whole pursuit now of the denturist licensing is really not what it used to be. It's more so just, I'd like to be, have the flexibility to see an occasional patient if I wanted to, you know, maybe make a high-end denture for somebody. And, and maybe it would be a more kind of probably take a back seat to my technical work at this point. Yeah. When did you take in your boards? Wow. You know, whenever I can get to it, it's been, it's been tough because I graduated. I want to say it's almost a year now and I just have not gotten to the board yet. The pandemic, of course, put it kind of a twist in everything. Sure. But you got all sorts of free time. It sounds like. Boy, you know, not so much. <laughs> 40 cases. That's a whole lot of free time, Elvis. Jesus. <laughs> In a year, by the way, you know, overachiever. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, though. A lot of people I'm talking to are busier in this pandemic than they were before, and that's that's kind of where we're at right now. So it's, yeah. it's a little difficult yeah. to keep up, but uh, I'm sure we'll get to it soon. But you might have to hire non-family to come in and help you out. Yeah, I know. That's it's it's going to be hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit of a control freak, you know. Muriel will tell you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Most dental technicians that are amazing, or yeah, um, we're pretty much all control freaks, I should just say. Yeah. Preface that by saying that. <laughs> yeah. Except for Elvis. He's the <laughs> control freak. <laughs> Capital T. You must work with a lot of dentists and, and prosthodontists where you are in the very beginning of treatment planning. Mm -hmm. I would imagine you almost require it on a lot of these cases. How do you get that relationship and what do you use to treatment plan? Well, I'm going to say this. So I think the first key that I've learned over all this time is that I, I do a really heavy screening for clinicians because, and unfortunately you just really don't know. I mean, look, you start lecturing and talking and you start, you know, people start maybe hearing a little bit about you and uh -huh. you're going to get cases from everywhere and you have no idea where these people are coming from clinically, right? So I put a lot of screens in place, first of all, just, just to stack my odds. And, and, and basically that involves basically just like, look, there's a new client application that you have to fill out. Mm -hmm. What that does for me is, boy, if you've got a narcissistic potential client or, or, you know, typically I, I know I've lost a lot right there. It's like, well, who does this guy think he is that I'm going to fill out an application? To yeah. Work? And that's awesome. That's a good thing. And and I always highly recommend to, to especially the smaller labs, like guys, like if somebody's not paying you, if you're having a problem, let it go sooner than later, because it's, it's just going to get worse. It's just not worth the time. Your, your time is better spent letting them go early as fast as you can, you know, for non-payment issues and moving on to find somebody that's going to be better. Oh, sure. So I think, I think I just, I heavily stack the screening side. I also kind of explain to people that all of our cases are pre-scheduled. That's kind of the second hurdle. So if they stick with me after finding out that we pre-schedule all of our cases as far in advance as possible, then I know that this person is pretty serious. I can also kind of gauge, I, I always like to schedule, before I work with anybody, I like to schedule a video chat just so okay. we can kind of talk and, and get to know sure. what they're expecting and what I'm expecting. And, and, you know, and, and I, as crazy as this might sound to my old former technician mentality, I'm looking for clinicians that truly view both of us as equals. There's nothing more enjoyable to, to work with somebody like that. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of planning, yeah. I mean, typically, like hopefully I'm getting this case. It doesn't always happen, but I would say probably 50% of our cases are 50 to 60% are well-planned. And that whole process just involves, for me at least, I try to stress to the surgeon and the restorative team that 
really what we need is, is a full workup of photos. We require photos for all of our work. Mm-hmm. The patient's standing. Uh, a, lot, not, a lot of people don't get that one. Uh, patient's sitting in the chair off to the side, and that tells me nothing. Um, so patient's standing, you know, directly looking at, at eye level with them. Uh, and I need like rest, smile, high smile. Yeah. If you want to send profile photos, that would also be nice. I'm really looking at the face first and looking at tooth positions first if we're on that side of the planning. And then then I can say, okay, now we can get into our CBCT and we can start to look at, okay, here's the existing tooth positions. Here's where we'd like to go. And here's how those tooth positions marry up with your available bone. Yeah. And then we can have a real collaborative, you know, treatment plan. Uh, typically that involves also a video chat where we're all looking at the CBCT with a planner and, and mm-hmm. we're all looking at where the implants should go, how much restorative space we need, how much AP spread we need, all those yeah. kinds of things. So what software do you use? So right now I'm actually, I team up with other people. So we have other oh, partners okay. that are doing the planning. So what we do is actually I say they do the planning. They have experience doing the planning, but what I always want is myself, the restorative doctor, the surgeon, and the planner to be on this video call. And I have a couple of different teams that I do that with. And what we do is we can all then have input and come away with a solid plan. I'm I'm not really interested so much in the implant guide or implant planning business. Yeah, um, I just stay in my wheelhouse of, of the implant restorations. But, uh, but I, we always want good communication when we're planning those implant positions so that everybody's satisfied. Yeah, for sure. You got to have all parties involved to get it done right, especially for something that you're doing. (laughs) Especially that. Just saying. (laughs) You guys are going off in a brand new uh, area for me. Sorry. I love it. It's great. (laughs) Well, when you talk to other ceramists and I sit there. Yes, I know. (laughs) You do. That's true. That's why I got them my little two cents in when he was talking about the meal. But that's all right. <laughs> I get it. It's okay. So we know you're on the fence about becoming denturist, but what else is next for you? What's exciting to 2021? Wow. Just I'm looking forward to seeing some people face to face again. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> no I love what I do. And, uh, and I love sharing the information. You know, we, I'll tell you, if it wasn't my passion, I wouldn't have been you know, literally shipping my hand mill and my electroformer around the country to give these courses before, you know, and, and that was, that's what we were doing. I mean, it was quite an endeavor, but it's really my, my wish that I, I get to see and uh, share with people here at our new place. And, you know, they can enjoy the facility. It's, it's, it's been kind of our passion is just getting this place up and running and, and making it a place that's very different, uh, I think, for technical education. And I'm excited about just sharing that experience with everyone. Nice. Well, I tell you, I'd love to check it out. I mean, not only would uh, Arizona in the winter sound inviting, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I am very yeah. interested in this whole telescopic bar yeah. thing. I mean, we do a lot of bars at our lab, but nothing that advanced. It's a lot of hater bars, a lot of wraparound bars, things like mm-hmm. that. But this yeah. is cool. It's cool stuff. Hey, you're, you're welcome anytime, man, if you want to come out and visit. You know, right now, obviously, we're going to have to take your temperature and... Uh... <laughs> Oh, yeah. go through all those hurdles but i'm looking forward to uh to getting people out here again yeah for sure well arian we appreciate you coming on the show man that was a quick hour i honestly yeah. i just kind of looked at the time just now and i realized that wow that's some good stuff hey i, I enjoyed it thank yeah. you for having me on thank you yeah we appreciate you coming on the program and we can't wait to see where you're gonna be when we can all be somewhere again yeah yeah, yeah. Look forward to it arian we appreciate it sir have a good one okay you too thank you thanks bye bye-bye Whitmix is super excited to announce the new Pro 4K large format 3D printer from Asiga. The open material printer for 385NM and 405NM resins features renowned Asiga reliability and super fast print mode for large batch printing of virtually all print resins. It's ideal for printing any kind of model, dentures, splints, surgical guides, impression trays, and more. As with other Asiga printers, the Pro 4K features the SPS, Smart Positioning System Technology, which ensures that the build platform is in the correct position when forming each layer, providing repeatable accuracy and production continuity. 
The Asiga Pro 4K DL printer is priced at under 25 grand, has a large build plate, and is available in both versions. For more information about the Asiga Pro 4K, visit Whitmix.com. We appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. A big thanks to Arian for coming on our podcast to talk about implant bars that are a little bit over our head. Amazing stuff that you and your wife are doing. So head over to deutschlab.com to see some of the pictures of his amazing work. And once this pandemic from hell is over, keep an eye out for when they will be hosting training sessions at his lab in beautiful Arizona. With his cappuccino bar. Right on. <laughs> like it. Super excited. Thanks, Arian. All right, everybody, that's all we got for you. Talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Oh, wait, that wasn't a question. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, say that again.